Welcome to the Rocco on YouTube channel. My name is Anton and today we're going to be talking about unit of work or how you've been sold a lie and everything that you know about unit of work is potentially not true. The reason I'm saying this is because recently I had a case where I could apply unit of work at work and naturally as a content creator I thought eh, I haven't actually made a video on unit of work. Let me go ahead and see what is out there. And what I find is essentially just a load of shit, right? If you Google for unit of work with C Sharp, you find this article from Microsoft of all things. And if you skip to the unit of work section, it is essentially a class. Sometimes it's presented behind an interface, but this is where you aggregate your generic repositories and all you're doing is you're passing a DB context into those constructors, which is just a load of shit. The justification for this being a unit of work is that DB context, the thing that is implementing the unit of work, is actually present in both of these repositories, right? If you go to the documentation of Entity Framework, you're gonna see that DB context is implementing a unit of work and it is registered as a scoped service in ESP.NET Core. So you're getting a unit of work per request. And by the way, if you follow this link, you will land on an article by Martin Fowler, which basically gives you a very succinct explanation of what a unit of work actually is. Maintains a list of objects affected by a business transaction or coordinates the writing out of changes and resolution of concurrency problems. This is basically an explanation for what Entity Framework Core is and how the DB context will behave. If you read this, this is essentially giving you the problem that Entity Framework solves. Now, the DB context being the implementation of unit of work, whenever you're just going to go ahead and try to slap on a bunch of adapters, wrappers, interfaces around the actual thing that is doing the unit of work, you're not implementing the unit of work. You're just piggybacking off this implementation. And this is Microsoft, right? They have a reputation for not doing their due diligence and just trying to ride the bandwagon of whatever wave is currently happening. So I decided to take it to YouTube, see what other professionals out there are saying on the topic, obviously in the ASP.NET Core, C Sharp space. And what do you think I find? Every single one of these videos talking about the same shit. A DB context wrapped in an interface. This is absurd. You're not implementing anything. The implementation inside the DB context is already done. If you're just putting it behind an interface and then matching the signature or putting some additional functions, you're not implementing unit of work. You're just utilizing it in your own wrapper or adapter or whatever you are creating. So today I'm going to show you how you can implement something that sounds something along the lines of this. A unit of work keeps track of everything you do during a business transaction that can affect the database. When you're done, it figures out everything that needs to be done to alter the database as a result of your work. Doesn't sound like a job of a wrapper to me. Remember, if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. Check out the description. I have a C Sharp course that is out. If you would like to know C Sharp as I do, I highly recommend you check it out. With that, let's go ahead and jump into the video. Here is our ASP.NET Core application and we're going to be going through a cache example. At the moment, we're capable of just reading and storing some kind of text. But the point of unit of work is that it is capable of spanning more than one function. Perhaps it is multiple services within your app. Perhaps it is multiple applications, right? So you have a message in one second, third application. At that point, your unit of work is distributed state essentially. And what you're trying to avoid doing is essentially talking to the database on each individual step. You're aggregating things in this unit of work until the work is complete. And then you're saving the final thing to the database. And by the way, in here, I am using Microsoft extension caching stack exchange Redis. This is what gives me this I distributed cache interface. And every single time I do set a sync or I do get a sync, we're talking directly to the database. If in one function, what I'm going to do is something along the lines of this. So I set things two times. I actually don't want any of these function calls to save anything to the distributed cache. I want to persist this data locally. And then after this unit of work, the request ends. That is when the data should be written to the cache. So what we're essentially looking for is some kind of wrapper around this native iDistributed cache client that is going to buffer this stuff. 
So here I have a cache unit of work which is implementing the iDistributed cache and we basically have to fiddle about with these methods and implement them as well. What I'm going to do is take this out into its own file so we can look at it separately and I'm going to give it an iDisposable as well. We're going to implement the missing members and because we will register cache unit of work as a scoped service. So builder services add scoped and this will need to be registered under the I distributed cache interface after the stack exchange redis. So this is the implementation that is going to be resolved over here. Inside add stack exchange redis, this is where this I distributed cache is being registered. So what we actually want to do is once we've registered it here, we want to pull it out and supply it as the implementation over here. So we have to build the service provider at this point and get the Redis cache, which we're going to use for the implementation of the cache unit of work right over here. We'll need to make sure that we generate the constructor. So CTOR, I distribute a cache, cache, come back to program CS. This will need to accept an instance of a service provider, which we really don't care about. And so when we are actually injecting this I distributed cache, we want to remove this I distributed cache from the I service provider over here. The way that you do this is you go to builder services and you get your single implementation of the service type where it equals to type of I distributed cache. This will give you the Redis cache service and then you can go ahead and remove it let's make sure that this works the app has restarted and if we land on this page we basically get a not implemented exception which is what we want so let's come back to the cache unit of work we will get this internal instance over here and we will initialize what is essentially a buffer at the moment we have a dictionary of something that we want to store and generally with unit of work what you want to do is you want to query and then keep that thing in the buffer and see if you're going to be changing that thing. I'm not going to be implementing change tracking at that level I'll just implement the tracking of whatever I'm trying to write that is the thing that I'm just going to hold off writing to the actual cache and retain it till the end of the service. So I need some kind of internal class or better yet record. So we're going to have an entry with a payload and then we're going to see if it's dirty or not. If it's dirty, we go ahead and write it at the end. So let's go ahead, take entry, put it over here. The buffer will be initialized and now we need to basically proxy everything to the buffer rather than the underlying cache. And here is basically the gist of the implementation. If we have something in the buffer, just return that thing. If you need to get it from the cache, get it from the cache, put it in the buffer and then return the thing. Super simple, same thing for the get async. Refresh is slightly different, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna proxy this uh, to the cache directly. The main thing that we're really interested in is the removing and writing. There are the two refresh functions. Next thing is the remove. What we're going to do is just store a null in the buffer for both of these. Here we're gonna need to return task uh, complete a task and make sure that we flip dirty to true. Now coming around to set, Guess what? We're not doing anything much different from the remove. We're just setting things in the buffer. The thing that we just tried to save to the cache, if we need to read it further down the line, we don't actually need to go anywhere. We have it here locally. Okay. And that is the whole premise. Now, when we go to dispose, and this is actually going to be an asynchronous operation, so it's probably better to remove this I disposable and then have something like task save changes async and then over the buffer for each key value pair if the value dirty then we want to go ahead and save it so here we use cache and let me scroll down a little bit set async Obviously, it depends what kind of a database or a cache you're interfacing with. Here with this I distributed cache, I cannot do a bulk update. So I'm basically going to have to write one by one. I'm going to wait and then in the key, store the payload. So the value payload. And there it is. Well, pretty simple, right? Coming back to program CS. Now in between where we hit the endpoint and we receive the request, we want to have some kind of middleware. So let's add a use function. And here we're going to have HTTP context. Let's just name it CTX. One too many braces for me here. This function should be called next. After next is done, we have executed our unit of work and after we essentially want to flush everything to the database. Here we go to the request services, we get required service, I distributed cache. 
this thing is going to be cached unit of work. Obviously, you can register this cached unit of work as a separate thing, but iDistributed Cache doesn't have that save changes interface, right? So I'm going to have to cache it to cached unit of work. So CU of, uh, of W, I think uh, that's a reasonable name. Uh, we then use this uh, thing and save changes async. Uh, wait. And there you have it. Now, if you have something along the lines of this, so GUID, new GUID, we are going to string this. So we're generating a new key every single time. And writer is being an absolute pain in the ass there. We're going to await here, remove the return, duplicate this a couple of times, maybe even store something in the original test string so I can actually see it. And perhaps it's even worth if we go to something like console write line over here. And we say something like updating some kind of key and that should be good. So let's wait for the application to restart. I'm already getting an exception, cannot return a bunch of bytes, obviously, because we don't have anything. So it will return null, but let's go ahead and store here. We will see that it is updating tests and that is being written back to the cache at save changes async. If I take a look at the Redis cache, so if we take a look at all the keys that we have here, here are the four keys. If I go back to the program and I remove this save async, uh, the application should restart. We'll still be able to read from the cache or as if we would try to write to the cache, but just to understand that this is the main point where unit of work is completing. If your unit of work is distributed, so you have many services interfacing with another service, which is keeping that state before it is committing it to the database, you're going to need some kind of final message, some kind of final event, some kind of final HTTP call, which is going to say, right, all is good. Go ahead and commit this to the database, or perhaps that is going to happen automatically if the unit of work has achieved a certain state. And by the way, in case you're wondering, let's say something along the lines happen. We're going to create two new services. We're going to have A and B. Both of them will accept an I distributed cache. Both of them will have a do function. And what I will actually do is add B over here, create a field for it. And inside of do, we're going to go to the cache. We're going to set not the async one. We will say A, some kind of key. So test to array. This will need U8 encoding. We're then going to go to B and do the same thing. Take B, place it over here. Instead of A, I am going to use a GUID over here. We can then take NB and register it with the dependency injection container. We'll then come back to store, inject A and B. And then instead of doing all of this stuff, we're just going to go to A and say do. And then we're going to go to B and say do as well. The point here is that as a scoped service, which is being kind of initialized over here or over here, there is only going to be a single unit of work for the request. So the I distributed cache that you're receiving over here or you're receiving over here or you're receiving over here, the framework is taking care of, of injecting the same instance into all of these places. You do not need like a wholesome wrapper around your DB context to make sure that it accepts an instance and you need to put that same instance into various generic repositories that you have. This will all receive the same I distributed cache. Let's come back to the terminal. I'm going to flush uh, all. We're going to take a look at the keys. Nothing should be there. There should be well a, a store method ready for me to execute. We're going to see the following entries being flushed or saved to the Redis cache. And there they are. And if we come back over here and we take a look at test, or sorry, the root endpoint, we're going to see this unit of work, which is being saved over here. And there we have it. Hopefully you can see how a unit of work is not some kind of wrapper around DB context with repositories. A unit of work is essentially this buffer. It can also act as a state machine where instead of just batching operations to your database, what it will do is it will encapsulate a use case which spans across multiple scenarios and slowly but surely events or requests will happen in your system, which will advance the unit of work. Finally, 
finally, when it's finished at the end, that's when it's going to save to the database. So don't believe everything that you read on the internet, especially if you're just locked in into the .NET ecosystem, try to look past it and see what people from other ecosystems say on the same subject. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. Don't forget, I have a C-sharp course out. And if you want the source code for this video, as well as my other videos, please come support me on my Patreon. I will be grateful and a very, very big thank you to all of my current Patreon supporters. Your help is very much appreciated. As always, thank you for watching and have a good day.